next story today is uh, slightly different. Uh, it begins in South Australia at the beginning of 2009. And at that time, Australia and South Australia in particular were suffering from several years of drought uh, in South Australia. There's a river which goes through it, the River Murray, and the water level in that river was, was falling really quite fast. And as a measure to conserve water, barriers were built between the low-lying areas beside the river and also Lake Bonnet, which you can see there in the slide, which is connected to the river. And what happened was that over several months in 2008, the water level went down uh, in this lake. The fish started dying. People got very upset in the local community of Barbara. People were literally in, in tears. A friend of mine told me um, he went in to get a picture on the server. A lady was in tears. She was so upset about what was happening to the, uh, to the lake, sort of representing the death of the local community. Um, and the, the government allocated 10 gigalitres of water, that's about 4,000 delivered swimming pools, to go back into the lake to partially refill it. And they chose an interesting solution. These are uh, siphons, which actually ran for, for 50 days. I actually arrived the day before they stopped using these siphons. Siphons. I took photographs and a video, and I thought I'd write a physics education paper on these siphons, on a siphon on a much larger scale than emptying a fish tank or getting uh, gasoline out of a car, legally or, un or not, not legally, I'm not going to actually done it. Um, but um, we're quite familiar with that, that use of the, uh, of the siphon. And I started actually doing um, research on them siphons and actually discovered that the definition of the siphon is incorrect in most dictionaries in the world. Most say that siphons work through atmospheric pressure and not gravity, which actually is how they, how they work. And in fact, quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of controversy uh, about this uh, subsequent to the, the paper I wrote about it. Um, what I find fascinating about siphons, it's really quite ancient technology. The first recorded use is in ancient Egypt. You see those tomb paintings from about 1430 BC where Egyptians are using siphons. It looks like it could be in a, in, a, in a kitchen somewhere. And they're drawing the liquid off those containers. It could be wine, you know, getting the clear wine from the leaves on the bottom. Or it could be Nile water which has been placed inside those vases with a lot of silk maybe they've allowed the silt to settle before drawing off the, the clean water from the top. Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian, writes in about 450 BC, after a visit to Egypt, that Egypt, the Egyptians used siphons in their irrigation. Uh, today, siphons are used extensively in the cotton industry in Australia. You might have seen it you know, out west, um, the tubes coming out of the irrigation channels on the cotton fields. Uh, and also in the US. But I think that in, in general there's kind of a lack of knowledge uh, in Australia or elsewhere in the world about the usefulness of siphons. So that's something I've been, been working on. Um, and I've come up with a list of uh, advantages of using siphons. And I think of particular use in remote regions uh, of the world and also uh, areas, especially uh, in the developing world, with. Uh, Subsistence farmers, smallholder farmers, um, could actually make use of uh, uh, this ancient technology in the 21st century. So something from uh, yeah, three and a half thousand years ago, which I think could have a more extensive use today. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we've got free energy as long as the, uh, as I've demonstrated a few moments, as long as the water ends up at a lower place than where it started, then you can use uh, gravity to run the cycle. Uh, and also, so it's no moving parts. There's no actual you know, turbines or motors, nothing. It's just a, a simple, a simple tube. Um, and to set it up, you don't need any excavations or building works. You just sort of put the uh, the tube over the uh, um, the barrier down into the water, and it will work. And also, we've got rudimentary flow control as well, uh, with, with, with 
excitement, so no need for fancy uh, control yeah, within certain uh, limits. And all those uh, four points mean that really uh, siphons are uh, a cheap option. You don't, you don't need uh, fuel or power if you've got this uh, siphon in a remote location. Um, no maintenance costs, apart from maybe, say, fixing some holes in the tube uh, sometimes to prevent air coming in. Uh, and also, um, you don't have to transport um, diggers to uh, remote regions to try and set up uh, pipes or whatever. So, there's a number of um, advantages in using, uh, using siphons. And um, I've come up with what I've called the, uh, the seven silver rules of the siphon. We often uh, come across uh, the golden rules. I thought maybe we need to sort of get silver in there. So I might actually spend a bit of money. Um, and what I'll do now is do a quick sort of uh, demonstration and leave those things up there on the screen. So what I've got here, I feel a bit like a magician, but not. Um, just a, a PVC tube and a uh, perspex cylinder, shows the perspex so you can see what's going on and uh, uh, a nice orange bucket, bucket. not quite in keeping with the TEDx colour scheme, but <laughs> So I've got an empty tube and I just push the tube in here, here the bubbling, so the bubbles have come out, which means water's got in. And uh, I'll keep one end in the, in the water and put my finger over this end and bring it out and down. And it's running. Can you see that there? And notice when I bring the tube up, as it gets higher, as the outlet gets higher, the flow reduces. See that? So it's going, going down. It nearly stops. And I can speed it up again. And the flow in, increases. And so that's like sort of raising or changing the depth of the of the reservoir, which is, which is here, and the flow is adjusted. So the higher the depth, the greater the flow, the lower the depth, the slower the flow. So in other words, it will tend to maintain the upper reservoir level at a, at a, at a constant a constant level, uh, which could be useful in some circumstances, which I'll explain in a few moments. So that's how the siphon works. And uh, if the tube was bigger, then uh, the flow would be uh, would be greater. And see some of the other things up there. And just down at the, the bottom, um, the maximum height for siphon at sea level is about 10 meters. At 10 meters, you get bubbles forming, uh, cavitation, which breaks a link between the, the water molecules, and, and so the siphon will stop working. But up near 10 meters, the actual pressure of the atmosphere on the side of the siphon is uh, well, basically. It's, most atmospheric pressure, and it can crush tubes flat. And uh, engineers assembly photographs of flat tubes where people didn't realise that it's been flattened because the siphon uh, operated. Okay, so now moving on um, to a different part of the world, Australia to Bhutan. I was there at the beginning of February to visit a, a, a colleague, student colleague, Son Guren, who's a, a physicist at the Royal University of Bhutan, and. There's me, of course, with um, Song, with the traditional go. Uh, I've got a bit of a pop belly. It's not quite as big as that, because um, <laughs> the, the go is a very interesting kind of uh, fabric around the front, um, which uh, Song calls the international pocket, because you put everything in it. And in that, I've actually got a video camera in there, I think, a still camera and a notebook. So I've actually found it quite um, convenient. After I actually put it off, which was a bit inconvenient. Um, but that's the traditional. Thing. Now, the first day I was there, we went up the, the Paro Valley. You, you land um, at Paro, it's the only place in that area of the country where it's actually flat enough um, for an international airport. Uh, incidentally, uh, Bhutan, some of you may not know where it is, so you only went tonight to look it up, uh, or you can go to the uh, globe there afterwards and see where it is. It's between India and China, um, just to the right of uh, Nepal, the small Himalayan. Kingdom 200 k's across by about 150 feet deep, so small by Australian, Australian uh, standards. Our first um, day there, we went up the valley and looked at the uh, mountain uh, John and Harry, so that's right on the border with China, and uh, we can see quite clearly that's covered in snow, but the mountains down below, or in the foreground, they're, they're not. And Song said that's extremely unusual, those mountains should be covered with snow in February, they're not. It's just like kind of a brown desert up there. Uh, and 
so I found it really quite um, kind of confronting to see the effects of climate change with my own eyes. And uh, the country has been suffering from uh, climate change. As often the case, the, the countries which are least, um, are least contributors to carbon emissions actually are suffering the first. And one problem is with the, with the glaciers, the glacial lakes in Bhutan. In fact, a study performed between 1963 and 1993 has revealed that 87% of the glaciers studied, 103 of them, have shrunk by an average of 6 metres per year. So that's the, yeah, the, 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 uh, the snow is receding um, up there. The other 13% have stayed the same size, but no glaciers have increased. So what we've got, we've got a lack of snowfall feeding the glaciers, and they're shrinking at an alarming rate. And the lakes which form at the head of the glaciers, which you can see here, this is the Lake uh, Totomi region, elevation of 4,500 metres, they're getting bigger, they're getting wider, and also deeper, and therein lies the danger. Uh, because the actual walls, which is the lady there, maybe I won't, yes. So the actual walls, you see there and there, they're made of loose stone and rock called moraine. And as the water gets deeper, the actual pressure, or the hydrostatic pressure, at the base of the dam walls increases, and there's a danger of the walls bursting. And that did happen in 94. In 94, uh, this is the village of uh, Panaka, um, in the, the valley uh, downstream, downstream valley from that Lake Totomi region at night in 1994, uh, a wall of water came down that valley, an inland tsunami, and devastated the village of Panaka and also killed over 20 people. In fact, a calculation shows that the energy in that glacial lake outwards flood was equivalent to a pretty large atomic bomb. That's the sort of energy that's stored in the water. So you've got millions of tons of water coming down uh, several kilometres. That's a lot of, of, of energy. Um, over the last few years, they've been trying to mitigate the problem. They've been um, sending hundreds of people up into this uh, region of the, uh, the actual uh, lake region there um, to dig, uh, dig a channel up to the, uh, up to the lake uh, to try and reduce the, the, the level. Uh, the funding's run out um, from that and so um, Som and I are actually looking at the possibility of using siphons to drain the, the glacial, glacial waters. And uh, this is uh, again in, in February that we visited the Department of Geology and mines on the government department off of Bhutan, that's it in, in Timbu, about 50 k's away from uh, Para where the airport is, and uh, we've set up a demonstration there, basically a miniature version of a siphon that could be used to drain the, the glacial lake. So that's something we're working on uh, together. Um, there's one possible um, design, basically the design that we demonstrated uh, at that uh, department, where we've got the um, tube going over the uh, wall, one way down here, a down at the top. <clears throat> and um, you fill up the tube, uh, open the tap, and the water will flow out. What I've uh, drawn in here, I've put in what I call the long short cut, uh, because if you were to drain the water in a traditional way, you'd need a sort of uh, bigger tunnel to the wall, or bigger channel, and these walls are fairly unstable, and that could be a, a, a problem. So here we can just put the, the, the pipe over the wall and away we go. So hopefully um, it will be, well if it, if it can work, there's challenges like what happens in the winter as it's frozen up and um, the stability of the wall with the siphon tube going over. Those are things that we're actually working on, but I think those problems can be overcome and maybe this technology from three and a half thousand years ago could have an application in the 21st century to try and uh, mitigate some of the problems associated with climate change in Bhutan, other countries, Nepal nearby has got the same problem, parts of India and other places in the world where the glaciers which are melting really, really fast. So thanks very much, I'll leave it there.